Hello, PsychU community, and welcome to today's webinar, Viruses, Vaccines, and Inflammation, Neurological Perspectives, which will be a three-part series. This is the second part of that three-part series, and today we will focus on inflammation and the neurological aspects of viral infection. Thank you for joining us today. Dr. Petit is a clinical neurologist for Neurology Associates PC and is also Associate Professor and Clinical Instructor for the Department of Neurology and Co-Medical Director for the Muscular Dystrophy Association Clinic within the University of Nebraska Medical Center, UNMC. He also serves as the Clinical Instructor in Neurology for the Lincoln Family Practice Residency Program. Dr. Petit has extensive experience conducting preclinical and clinical trial research, as well as hundreds of scientific publications, abstracts, and oral presentations. Thank you so much, Jackie, and thank you, Dr. Petit, for joining us. I think we've all had a lot of fun working on this project, so I'm super excited to be able to share this with the PsyQ community. So as we're going to transition now to talk a little bit more about viruses and inflammation, so we're going to be going uh, and getting some, some more deep information on the inflammatory process and to what Gary has alluded to already tends to be uh, more severe cases where we see that inflammatory process not really calming down as it should. So it, it could be helpful in case you wanna refer back to some resources that have been available for some time on PsychU. There's quite a bit of information on psychoneuroimmunology that you can go back and refresh yourself on differences between the innate and adaptive immune responses within the human body and then this whole inflammatory um, cascade that is set in motion once a pathogen has been detected. So as we get into this discussion, um, Gary, if you could walk us through just sort of some basics on the viral impact for the inflammatory response, and then we'll start diving into what people are probably really interested in hearing more about uh, being the cytokine storm. Yeah, absolutely. So just a quick review, and that's what this slide constitutes of the inflammatory mechanisms involved, and we'll go point to point. Viruses can increase the production of cytokines, which are inflammatory products uh, within the cell uh, being a part of the innate or first line immune response mechanism. A neurotropic virus can activate glial cells, which are within the central nervous system, inducing a pro-inflammatory state. We'll touch on that a little later because that may be the mechanism between some of the cognitive changes we're seeing in these individuals. Now, a key player in this entire innate system is the interleukin-6 playing a central role in the cytokine uh, storm, which we'll discuss. It's correlated with the severity of the COVID-19 symptoms. It can induce excessive and prolonged cytokine responses, which can be aberrant to, to the individual as well as the cell. As mentioned, the cultured glial cells have also been shown to secrete large amounts of inflammatory factors. And these are all pro-inflammatory factors that we have listed here after infected with the coronavirus. And after, last bullet point, after activation of immune cells in the brain do cause chronic inflammation, brain damage. And one of the real concerns with this virus is how long it lasts and to what degree does the inflammation continue and what settles it down? We simply don't know. We know that the IL-6 is produced by monocytes and macrophages and it's stimulated by toll-like receptors uh, on, these, uh, on these innate cells. But uh, if we can find a way to somehow curtail the production of the IL-6, that might also be a potential treatment for this uh, for this condition. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Gary. And that really sets the stage. One of the points that I always try to highlight when we're talking about inflammatory markers, um, when you hear the literature, it's easy to maybe just think of cytokines as being the bad guys. Uh, but like everything in life, you need to strike a, a nice balance. And we couldn't live without an increase in cytokines when you start to have um, a pathogen detected or some sort of acute injury. And so this is really walking us through a lot of the individual variation and variability that we're seeing with presentations of COVID infection and how some people are able to kick into motion the innate and adaptive immune responses and then have a, a pro protective immunity and host survival, whereas some go down more of a maladaptive path and develop an acute inflammatory response that's excessive and prolonged, and that's where we run into problems like some of this acute respiratory distress syndrome that you're going to talk a little bit more about. So if you could share some specifics about this graphic for our PsyQ viewers, that would be amazing. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Another great slide. Uh, just to divert slightly, in the ALS world, we have a focus on 
curtailing the progression, the propagation of a disease. And we look at the microglial network. There's been a lot of debate trying to determine, do we suppress or enhance microglial functioning? And the answer is that sometimes it's needed in both scenarios. So as you can see the left side of this slide, there are causes of inflammatory response can be either pathogenic and protective. Uh, there can be dysregulation of the inflammatory process or a regulation of it. And so that different phases in any infection, we will need, we will need both, both mechanisms at, at play. And, and that's what makes it so complicated as to how to address some of these types of conditions by attacking individual cells. Uh, middle column, consequences. The consequences of a pathogenic dysregulated inflammatory process is a robust viral replication. That's what we don't want to see, because as the virus replicates, it propagates even further with a delayed interferon response. Of course, the interferon is another component that we focus on within the nervous system. As a neurologist, we're looking at interferons in a lot of our neuromodulatory uh, mechanisms with our MS patients, so that's come to play as well. The bottom graphic in a protective state, there's a non-robust viral replication with an early interferon response. Now, both states, however, lead, as the middle section suggests, to an inflammatory monocyte macrophage and neutrophil infiltration with pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. The, the real question is, will they be protective or destructive? Uh, in the pathogenic form, under the outcomes section, you can see there's an enhancement of apoptosis, which means programmed cell death, increased vascular leakage, suboptimal T cell and antibody, the adaptive immune system response with impairment of the viral uh, clearance mechanisms. Whereas under the protective, it's just really the opposite. We see minimal apoptosis, reduction of the vascular leakage. We see a, a very robust T cell and B cell response and, and effective clearance, uh, suggesting off to the right protective immunity, host survival versus acute lung injury, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and subsequently death. So the inflammatory response to respiratory viral infection can take a couple of different pathways. And depending on what part of the mechanism is involved, oftentimes dictates whether it can be pathogenic, out of control, or protective. Beautifully done. Thank you for walking through that complicated graphic for our PsyQ community. So now we're going to transition and talk just for a couple of slides about this concept of hypercytokinemia or what has been uh, termed in the media, it's probably easier for most people to say, cytokine storm. So um, you've already set the stage a little bit with the IL-6, which is obviously a key player in this. Um, and then there are in our little lightning bolts and um, bursts there, you can see some of the other key cytokines that have been associated with more severe presentations of uh, COVID-19 cases. Great. This is another, I think, a key point with this particular virus that has to be emphasized because I'm asked all along, well, wait a minute, coronaviruses are known to cause a flu-like illness. What makes this one so different? Well, this particular strain of coronavirus, humans have never been exposed to. And that's the most important point because when a virus enters and our body starts to respond or react, our first line of defense, as you mentioned, is the innate immune system but sometimes it gets overactive. And that's what a cytokine storm is. As we read through the bullet points, it's a systemic inflammatory response caused by infection, some drugs, other factors, characterized by a sharp increase in the level of a large number of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, as evidenced in the, in the cartoon on the right. Now, this is what has made the difference, I think, between this virus and so many others, that this cytokine storm in relatively young, healthy individuals can lead to a multi-system, almost a septic response. So they get multi-organ failure and death. We're seeing young people in their teens and 20s and 30s die from this virus, thought likely to this cytokine storm mechanism. So the inflammation associated with this begins at a local site and spreads throughout the body. Last point, uh, the cytokine storm is exemplified by severe lung infections. This is probably where it all starts, which sets the trigger in which the local inflammation spills over into the systemic circulation. And, and this, is, this is what's killing people. Uh, once the lungs stop working, uh, survival even with a ventilator is, is very limited. 
So that's why I think it's so important to uh, recognize the pathogenicity of this particular strain of virus. And hopefully people listening in will understand that uh, it, it is not the average flu virus we're dealing with. This can be a fatal illness and we can't always identify who's at highest risk. 